the hope of any designer when you separate the, the business side out of it is to resonate with people to bring good to people's lives to change their mood for the better to make people happy or at the very least inspire a reaction good or bad When something is designed well, it's effortless. People embrace it and they adapt to it and get on living with it. But if something's designed poorly, it'd be quite hard for a designer to come back from that. You know, you're only as good as your last gig. Watches are really unique objects in that they, they bridge a number of different industries, if you like. From product design to utility to fashion to jewellery. And each sector has its own pitfalls and rules that you need to adhere to if you want to be successful as a whole. There's a load of psychological an emotional and social decision when it comes to choosing and wearing a watch. Many don't really care what brand it is, they just like the colour or they like the design of the face or it resonates with them in some emotional way. But for many, what brand a watch is or the history that it comes with it really matters. As physical objects, watches are really quite discreet, you know, from five metres away. You, you can't really tell what brand a watch is. You can maybe tell the colour and the size, obviously, but... Watches are generally small and unobtrusive. You can wear a massively expensive watch and nobody be any the wiser. In that sense, a watch is quite a complex object in that it can convey everything from personal taste and style and status, wealth, knowledge. A watch has great personal importance. You know, they can mark special events. You're getting married or you're having a child and you want to pass that down. If you think about what objects are most passed down through generations, a watch is always quite high on that list. I guess it's because there's that physical attachment to that person and it goes with them through all of life's experiences and moments and journeys and when that watch is passed on those memories come with it. And you can look at photos of your grandparents and there's your granddad wearing the same watch that you wear now. It has that emotional attachment. So as a designer of watches there's a whole lot to think about before you even get to the designing of the watch. And when you do collect all this base knowledge, you realise that you haven't even scratched the surface. We're just heading into March now, working full speed towards submitting our design proposal document in a few weeks. Our aim is to get production complete and the constant run to us by the end of September. It seems like a tight schedule and it is, but our work on the constant actually started back in December 17. A lot of pre-design work needs to be done to make sure that the factory is up to speed with our requirements for the project and everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet before any chat turns to design. This will be the first time we've used this factory, so there's a lot of new parameters we need to learn and discuss. What we expect versus what they can deliver. After a bit of time now, we're really happy with the way we are set up and moving forward.
We launched the company back in 2016 with the Cherwell, and today it's been the most interesting of all our designs, in that when every one of them is laid out beside each other, people are always drawn towards a Cherwell. As we head into the initial design stages with the Coniston, we want to explore that reaction and, coupled with the feedback from other designs, gather it all together into what will hopefully be a solid and resolved design for the Coniston. Before anything begins, we need to decide what movement we will use, and more often than not, the first hurdle is cost. What movement we use will almost always dictate end cost, and so we need to be careful right from the get-go. All our movements so far have been manual winding mechanicals and we're continuing that with the Coniston. We're choosing the larger version of a movement we've already used in the Derwent range. Now that the movement is chosen we can start to think more clearly about the design direction and getting initial thoughts and ideas down. This starts with the diameter of the watch. The trend in the industry for a while was swinging bigger and bigger. 50mm diameters weren't really uncommon. More recently though, we've noticed a sea change and there's a lot of watches now released nearer the 38, sometimes 36mm mark. For the Coniston, we want to aim right in the middle and go for 40mm. It's the mark with the most scope. You can be clever with what happens inside that diameter to make the watch seem bigger or smaller. You can have a wide bezel and busier dial which will make the watch feel smaller on the wrist. Or you can have a thin bezel and quite open dial, which will make it feel or wear a lot bigger than the diameter suggests. The lugs are next, with the width between and the lug to lug size is really important for the way the watch looks, but also how it sits on the wrist. If the watch has really long lugs, it can make the watch sit awkwardly on the wrist. Then finally the crown. With a hand crank, it's especially important to get the diameter right, as it's the main point of contact almost every day. Too small and it's hard to wind, too big and there's a likelihood that torque will become a factor, twisting the crown right off the stem due to excessive torque. All of these things are small things but they all have massive impacts. So a lot of time is spent in the sketch stage, getting ideas down and thinking about what we want to do for this project. Once we've got these basic parameters set, we can start to really get into the design and work out the dial design and how everything fits together. We spend months in this stage, tinkering and tweaking and talking back and forth between ourselves. We then take it into CAD and start becoming a bit more accurate about how we're doing things. Once we're fairly happy with the design, we'll take it into 3D. And this allows us to spin around the watch and just see how light plays off it. We can take it into different environments and see how that reacts with the materials and the shadow and light. We can then tweak the design as we go along. The aim in this stage is to get the design to a point where we can gather it all together into one cohesive document, which we call the design proposal. This little book is the reference point for the factory. It's what we submit as our design requirements and start the conversation off with. The factory checks over and comes back to us with initial feedback, what we can and can't achieve within the budgets or timescales. This feedback loop continues until we get to a point where the design is resolved and we can then move on to the next stage. At that point we will freeze the design and commission prototypes. Getting prototypes made allows us to check everything over one final time to make sure it's all working and looking exactly how we want it. After which, we'll sign off on the design and the Coniston, after four months of work, will finally head to production.